to look at rocket components and design next. The X-1, this was Chuck Yeager's um, famous flight where he broke the sound barrier, flew Mach 1.06, and it was dropped from a bomber uh, using liquid propellants, oxygen, and liquid and alcohol um, because it had to get up to speed before they could actually launch this off so they could get um, up to the final speed. Launching from the ground would have taken too much of the fuel. So um, it was the first again to exceed the sound barrier. There's also some space launch vehicles that um, use rocket propellants. The space shuttle, it had 67 propulsion systems. Uh, that's a lot. That's more than 66 even. There's some military missiles that uh, use rocket propulsion. So all sorts of great things using rocket. There's the space shuttle. It's awesome. And it's no longer in use because it was too expensive. Um, and now we get into space tourism. And this is not space tourism. That's actually a missile. Um, uh, this is more like space tourism, and so now some private companies are starting to get into rocketry, and um, SpaceX is able to land rockets uh, vertically, uh, which is really cool because now we can reuse them, which is the majority of the cost in rockets. Um, so let's take a look at this first. You're going to want to pause this, maybe draw this picture. These are the components into a rocket, and what I really want you to take note of is this tiny, tiny, tiny piece of the nose cone. That's the payload system. Everything else is part of um, the functionality of the rocket. So a huge percentage of this is just to get this thing, this little tiny payload system off the ground to where you want it. So you have a lot of it as fuel, um, oxidizer, so like the alcohol and oxygen or fuel and oxygen, the pumps to mix them at the correct ratios. And then you have your fins, then the guidance system up in the top. That's your rocket components. Make sure you draw those out. Center of gravity has to be in front of center of pressure. G before P. G before P, just like the airplane. And that's what allows this thing to stay stable. So here's a couple different pictures that kind of show um, some stability or instability. Which one is instable? If you said C, you're correct. Got to get a pause there just to make sure you can test it out for yourself. Uh, this one is quite a bit more stable because there's a greater distance here. And that's going to be really important when you design your own rocket to have um, as much of a distance as is practical between G and P. So these are the components that we're going to use. Uh, we have our tube. We have this little uh, launch lug here. Uh, this little metal thing kind of holds the engine in. And then the nose cone should pop off. And then we got a little parachute in there. It should pop off. Um, so that's, uh, that's all the stuff that you're going to use to design. And then we have the fins, and it's important, you know, how you cut the fins so that the grain is along the leading edge and those kinds of things, which we'll talk about later. So here's some forces in flight. We've talked about these a bajillion times. Weight, thrust, drag, and lift. One thing here that you'll notice is that lift is actually forcing it back upright. It's lifting it back upright. And fins along with G before P, help to self-stabilize a rocket in flight. It's really kind of cool. So let me show you this picture here. If we are launching, and um, you can look at this picture, you can look at my little rocket here. Um, if we are launching and we, we start to tilt like this, the air is traveling down relative to the rocket, because the rocket is moving up against the air, so it's pushing down on this fin. So it pushes the fin essentially back this direction. So that um, adjusts the nose back into upright. Now if it goes too far, then one of these fins, which is three of them is the minimum, one of these fins tries to straighten it back out again. So no matter which direction that it starts to fade, as long as you have propulsion and you have that wind pushing against these fins, you're going to get a relatively straight up and down flight. Now, the more fins you have, uh, the more corrective ability you have, but then you have more resistance. So um, you're going to have to sort of play with that in your design. Uh, determining rocket weight, you're going to want to pause this too. So if you figure out what the weight of the nose is, plus the weight of the recovery and all of these things, uh, you're going to get the total weight. And that's just to figure out the total weight. So that's actually a pretty easy one. I'm not talking about center of gravity or center of mass yet. Uh, that's just total weight. You add them all up. Okay. So center of gravity is figuring out where the center of gravity is for each component. And if the component is in uniform size, it's right in the middle. Now the nose is not. It's really the only thing that is not uniform. The fins are not uniform either, I guess. Um, so the center of gravity for the nose, you may actually have to determine by balancing. You can draw on it, 
find where the mass is, and then that gives you your distance. Now they're using a reference line of the butt of the uh, of the rocket here at the back end, um, so that would be fine. We can use that reference line. So then we take the weight of the nose times the distance, and then we add that to the weight of the recovery times the distance from the reference line. Add that to all of the individual pieces, weight times their distance, and the distance is the center of its weight, the center of the mass of each individual component. Once you find out and you total all those things together, if you divide it by the total weight, you're gonna get the distance of the center of gravity. And then you're gonna end up marking that on the rocket. And in this one, it, it's right here. That's your center of gravity. Center of air pressure, so hopefully you drew that out or pause it, rewind it, look at that. Center of air pressure is finding the um, area times the distance of it plus the area of the next component, the body, times the distance, plus the area of the fins times this. Only three things, because there's only three things showing on the exterior. We're going to ignore the uh, the area of this launch lug, and we're going to ignore the area of the little rocket piece out the back here. It's going to be a little bit of a rocket engine sticking at the back in this metal. So really, it's finding the surface area of this cone. So you're going to have to find the equation for how do you find the surface area of a cone. And you can approximate this as a cone, even though it's uh, it sort of tapers up. Um, and then we have a cylinder here, and then you'll need to find the center of the area of your fins, depending on whatever the shape is. Um, and then wherever the distance is, we add those all up, and we divide it by the total area, so the area of all of these, divided by that total area. Remember the area of the fins is both sides, and then you're going to get to find the center of air pressure, and in this case, it was quite a bit further back. There's, uh, there's close to about three quarters of an inch, so that's pretty good, that's very stable. Um, remember, it's important that you have your rocket engine in here when you're actually doing center of gravity because that's going to make a huge roll. Rocket engines weigh quite a bit. Rocket flight, if your original flight path is up and you want it to be up, but there's a wind, then you're going to have to sort of tilt your, and look, I'm looking at the middle picture there, we have to tilt it into the wind so the wind blows it straight up and down. So those are things that we have to consider when we're outside is really pay attention to the wind. Otherwise, you're going to be chasing it down for miles because the parachute um, the rocket will fly relatively straight up and down, um, even if you have a decent wind, but once the parachute comes out, it really glides on that wind. So that's where we have to really be careful. So this is kind of an idea of that. Um, if this, you're intended to go up and you have wind, you go here, and then we actually lose altitude on that because it, it's only a certain amount of time that this engine goes for it pops a cap, but then it, it ends over here in uh, Illinois, which we don't want to go to Illinois because um, the bears are there. So rockets, um, really good professional rockets have these attitude control adjusters that are super cool. Some of them can be with the fins here. Some of them have um, some fins down below, but a lot of them have a nozzle that's sort of on a gimbal that can pivot. So if it starts to move in this direction, then that nozzle starts to spray, it, that gimbal starts to push propellant off in the other way and kind of um, changes it to make it upright again. So this actually pivots to um, keep the rocket upright. And then um, you may have some attitude adjustment thrusters if it's um, actually out in orbit or if things are, if it's actually flying, you need to make some small corrections. Um, something that's in orbit would be like the space shuttle that needs to make attitude adjustments. And that's it for our rockets.